Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. I'm joined right now by Kevin Flaherty, but we've got a really, really fun podcast coming your way this Wednesday morning. Um, Kevin and I are joined by Travis Goff, the Kansas AD. Uh, Kevin, we talked a lot of topics during the course of about a 30-minute interview, which will run after this intro. Kevin, what, what was your favorite topic we covered? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the the topic du jour, I guess, if you will, is talking about the Gateway Project and the mm. stadium improvements and everything for football. But I, I really thought that, you know, and I'm not trying to – it's not that I'm trying to attract people to listen to every last minute, but I really thought we closed out on, on a strong note, you know, talking about some of the things like the, the general picture in college athletics and – and even maybe where Kansas sits in, in certain IARP type stuff. Mm. So there, uh, there were some some pretty interesting topics to tackled. What uh, what kind of stood out to you? Yeah, I think that I think the stadium stuff continues to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know something Travis Goff gets asked a lot about is the stadium and the renovation and the capacity. And I thought he gave some really frank answers about the capacity for Memorial Stadium after these renovations are done the timing of it and talking about phase two, right? Because when, when KU announced this whole thing, a lot of it was really focused on phase one and phase two was a little bit more, I don't know if ambiguous is the right word, but just a little bit more, not concrete on what the timetable looked like. Um, he gave some thoughts on that as well. And obviously talked about the start of the, the football season for KU. So I thought it was really enjoyable. Um, real quick, Kevin, let's talk a little about this weekend, a game like Nevada, I'm sure we'll do our, I know we'll do our podcast on Sunday, but a game like Nevada, this is interesting. It's a little, I don't know if I could even say a letdown spot, but I'm interested to see what we see from KU on, on Saturday, considering the travel issues that they're going to be. Kansas will stay Saturday night in Reno, come back Sunday morning, the back end of the travel we'll talk about on Sunday, but just what are you kind of expecting to see from KU this week against a Nevada team that is pretty bad? Yeah, and, and I think you know that that's harsh, but I mean that's played out on the football field. It it, it, it is what it is, and, and I think you know what you want to see is you want to see Kansas come out and take care of business and get better because yeah. when you look at and I realize this is cliche, but when you when you look at a football season, there's only so many chances, right? You work all see all year long. And the season's gone like that. And so you don't want to miss an opportunity and basically sleepwalk through a game and a chance to get better, a chance to polish up some things. Potentially, if you play this right, Swain, it's a chance to manufacture depth, right? Because if you if you come out, you play really well, you jump out to a big lead, you can rotate through more guys and, and get them, you know, game action on Saturdays and and things of that nature. And so I, I think while, you know, a lot of people would look at this and, and kind of say, hey, this is, you know, I don't want to say the least important, but, you know, mm -hmm. maybe this is the game on the schedule that draws your attention the least of the remaining 10 games. I think it still has an importance because it is your last chance to kind of clean and polish some things up before you get into Big 12 play. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's one of those keep momentum going. Yeah. And then head into that BYU game. And that's something we talked about as well with Travis. What is that BYU crowd going to look like? I'm expecting a good one, but Kevin, that should do it for us. Um, thanks as always for listening and hope you all really enjoy this conversation with Travis Goff. All right. We are very pleased to welcome in a special guest for this episode. We are joined by Travis Goff, the athletic director for the university of Kansas Travis, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to, to chat with Kevin and I. Uh, good, good to see you guys, Michael, Kevin. Appreciate the opportunity today. Yeah, most definitely. Well, we, let's just dive right in here. Um, a lot to talk about, right? Football is, is really taking off and got to go back to, to last Friday, I think, to start off. The TV numbers have come in from what I saw today from Brett McMurphy. I believe it's 1.36 million people watched Friday night's game against Illinois. You know, I remember Travis, we talked over the summer and you'd mentioned how big of an opportunity it was to play in front of a national audience. Could that have gone any better? And just how do you feel like the, that national audience will help you guys as an athletic department? 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, when we had the opportunity provided by ESPN to consider moving from a Saturday to the Friday and then obviously needing to work with an opponent, it, it probably was, you know, it even surpassed my hopes and expectations for what it could be, right? You know, on week two, you know, you're going to have all these incredible non-conference matchups, the likelihood of, you know, Kansas and Illinois being kind of tucked away on like an ESPNU and 11 a.m. I mean, who knows where it would have fallen, but the reality is it wasn't going to be front and center Saturday. So you're talking triple, quadruple, even maybe more the eyeballs to get that Friday slot. And it required a little bit of consternation. It, 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 it had an impact on week one when we were initially targeting Thursday. Um, I got to give credit to, to Illinois for their, you know, willingness, um, took some, took some navigating, but willingness to ultimately land there. And, you know, our span stepped up, our students stepped up. We had the uni reveal, which just kind of worked out well as adding some additional storylines and attention to it. And then more than anything, the staff and the student athletes did their part and they did it at a really high level. So it was a great night for Kansas and Kansas football. Yeah. I think looking back to last year, right? You think two of the last three games for KU, you go toe to toe against a really good Arkansas team. Obviously there's the Missouri state game sandwich in the middle, but now there's a a big 10 win, right? The first for Lance Leipold, I'm curious for you, Travis, just generally, right? I think three, four years ago, if you told a Kansas fan, hey, you're going to go toe-to-toe with an SEC team in a bowl game, and then two games later at the start of the next season, you'll beat a Big Ten team that's finished or picked to finish, you know, middle of their division. I think a lot of people would have been very surprised to hear that. For you, just how impressed have you been with the job, you know, Lance and the coaching staff have done over really, you know, what's more or less two and a couple month years. Well, you guys follow it closely and, and you know it as well as I do. Maybe at times you know it better than I do. But the reality is it's uh, close to unprecedented to be to be frank about it. I mean, you know, it wasn't even but a year ago we're talking about a Kansas football program where, um, you know, some good indications, some some nice pieces, some young talent needs some development. Uh, maybe not quite there on the on the on the offensive or defensive line, so to speak. And then just a short time down the road, you know, we're maybe physically um, outmatching in some ways a Big Ten opponent that honestly, I, I wouldn't be surprised for a minute to see them right in play for a Big Ten West, you know, divisional championship up there at Illinois. I mean, we know. The, uh, they got an incredible coach and Brett Billima and staff and resources and they've got NFL guys on the on the fronts on both sides, um, capable more than capable skill players. So yeah, the reality is for our guys to have done what they've done, in particular that first half to play as clean a football as I think I've seen in person, um, arguably ever, um, and to do it in a, in a way where we really beat them in all facets. That's not fluke. That's not just a good night. That's not the stars aligned in Lawrence. That's that's a program that's been built in just a short time frame to compete any weekend against any opponent. That's that's, I think, the reality of it. And you had a a pretty good sized crowd out for it. And and I know, you know, we're going to talk different things and, and probably hop up and down a little bit with the with the Gateway Project. But one of the, the questions that we get the most about the Gateway Project is the increased capacity. And I know you said there's some fluidity to that, a little bit of that's up in the air. But one of the questions that we get, you know, you, you've been here when Kansas has sold out a 50,000 seat stadium. And you've also been here when Kansas has had 35,000 fans come out. And it didn't look that great because there was so much extra room in the stadium. And so the question that we get a lot is how do you, how do you kind of bridge that gap where you're making it to where you have sort of that game in game out, really good home field advantage while at the same time, if the football program takes off the way that you think it could, that we think it could, that fans think it could, maybe you're not also leaving meat on the bone, so to speak from a capacity standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great question, Kevin. It's one I, I try and answer as honestly as I possibly can. And, and on, you know, the other part of it is it's, a, it's really a kind of a complicated question. I'll do my best sure. with you guys today. And, and I'll, 
I'll start by um, really giving credit to the people that were there Friday night. I mean, you guys are right. It was a really good crowd. And why was it a really good crowd? Because at whatever the number of people that came to that game Friday night and the students that were there stepped up and supported this program. And it's a, it's a significant improvement. It's a great step forward and it's credit to those that were there period behind that. But I can also pivot pretty quickly and say, it's gotta be better than that. And I, and again, that that's not a criticism. That's just more a message to those that didn't come who pondered who thought about it, who, who, you know, had some, maybe they had a couple of challenges there. There we know with Friday night, there's some real, um, um, challenges as it relates to high school football and other, but we, we got to be better. We should expect that to be a sellout at, at every turn. And I think our guys have, have earned that. So there's a little bit of, um, I guess call it even criticism guys, to be honest about those that, that didn't come Friday night. And I think we're trying to find the delicate balance. The other reality is I think we announced 45,000 something or other, you know, you're not literally counting the bodies in the seats when you get that number. There's a good size. It's, it's very legitimate. It's absolutely, we, we think it could have been that many people, but the reality is there weren't 45,000 people in the stands in a 47,000 capacity stadium. And so this delicate dance of what should the capacity be on the new David Booth cancer Memorial stadium versus our high watermarks of the past, you know, there's some of that in, in consideration. Um, we obviously haven't had sustained success to be able to demonstrate. And this is again, given our, our fans plenty of leeway, we haven't deserved full houses over a lot of years. So I certainly believe that. And as an alum feel that myself, uh, but at the same token with a stadium project of this magnitude and of this investment, one of the things we don't want to do is, is, provide an experience that isn't first class for every patron. And as the thing grows and gets bigger and you stretch further and further away from that sideline, that's what happens. And I think there's a point of kind of diminishing returns on capacity and on experience. And then the last thing is, you know, we, we have to make some decisions around how much of an investment should we make in the premium opportunities versus you know, the thousands and thousands of additional seats that we could put up in corners or way up at, a, at, the, at the highest level of a, of a West side. Um, and those are just fiscal decisions that come into uh, uh, consideration. And, and related to that is some of it is how do we fund this thing? And the reality is it's going to require great participation in our premium seating opportunities in order for this to be a financially viable project. We, we didn't just make this decision out of, um, well, it's past due time or people deserve it. We made it because as a business model, we have to have this project done right. And we have to have it creating incredible new revenue streams that our athletic program has never had. Because if we don't do that, then we've got to make some really hard decisions here at Kansas Athletics. And a lot of programs and a lot of student athletes would be implicated by the decisions we would have to make in this kind of ever increasing world of cost around investing in athletics. So again, it, it, we could have a whole session guys on, on how the capacity thing works, but I'll finish with this because this is going to get boring in a minute. I'll finish with this premise that we're making decisions now about the West and the North. And when I said at some point, I don't know if anybody paid attention to this. I said, Hey, it's kind of up to us. What do we want the East to be? Well, number one, we got to be able to fund it, right? We need philanthropy and donor support and other things to, to give us the ability to go and tackle the East, hopefully soon after we open up the West and the North in two years. But number two, we haven't made any decisions around how big the East should be and or how much premium we might want to put in on the East. That can be all, you know, really a clean slate for us to determine over these next couple of years. So our fans truly will have a lot to say about total capacity when it's all said and done. And, and real quick, Travis, I remember you mentioned that, right? I think during the, the press conference you had done after that. So in an ideal world, world for you, phase two, what would the time frame be? Again, if this goes perfectly to how you could plan it, um, I know we've got dates for phase one, right? Which is the North and West sides, but for that East stand, 
what would be an ideal scenario for you then in terms of a time frame for having that be done? Yeah. Um, you know, the East situation is not just a financial decision. If we had the, the funding, right, in a perfect world, if we had this, you know, unbelievable amount of funding to, to be able to tackle the entirety of a new construction, I still think we'd be doing this phase process because I still think we'd be wanting to play through it next year and stay home. I think that's the right thing for the young men in the program. I think that's best for competitive advantage and continuity and all those other great things. So a lot of it really has to do with we need that East and whatever supplemental uh, grandstands or additional seating we can provide to play through the 24 season. So I do know that um, we're talking about two years, the fall of 25, new West, new North conference center, finished Anderson family football complex. I know all of that needs to be a hundred percent completed, right? We need to have, you know, dotted I's cross T's gone through punch list and we need to have felt like it's funded in a, in a really, um, strong manner, a manner that can maximize this new revenue stream for our athletic program so we can reinvest in the student athlete experience, um, which just to me means I think the, the best case is we're really, uh, uh, you know, creating a plan that has a chance to begin construction in, you know, hopefully 2026, 20, right? If you're thinking about opening 25, ideal state we're doing some demo and starting some construction in 26 on the east is it possible anything's possible um a lot of people would say that what we're doing in this first phase would have been impossible so i fully believe it is but we got to get some things to hit and and that's certainly continued success on the field continued support from our fans literally by starting with selling this thing out now not in 25 selling this thing out now for the rest of the year. And then it's going to take really incredible philanthropic support from our donor base who have been tremendous, but we got to, we got to continue to grow in that regard too. I I know being an alum and and also seeing you on game days, you kind of bounce around between different tailgates and tents and stuff like that on the, on the Hill, I, I guess, what was the consideration given to, to parking and tailgating and sort of the atmosphere there? And, and what are going to be some of the answers there? Because I, I think, you know, you, you see the picture of, of everything. And I think that was another question that we got quite a bit from fans is, you know, okay, what's the parking situation going to be? Where are the tailgating opportunities going to be? Yeah. Um, we are really conducting studies on, on both fronts, Kevin. We put, yeah. Um, significant, I guess, discussion and, and thought process going into, in particular, if we were going to open the east up, that current surface level parking lot, if we were going to open that up to the developer community, we had to at least know that there were going to be other parking opportunities to more than make up for what would be lost there. So we at least went that far before rolling out, obviously, just a few weeks back. And now we're underway with a, 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 a parking consultant doing a study to really uncover the details around how many spots What's the ratio of surface level versus potential deck parking? What are the advantages of each, right? You can tailgate on a surface level, but your efficiencies maybe aren't as good. A deck may give you more, more, more uh, capacity, but sometimes ingress and egress is a pain in the rear. If anybody who's parked over here at the garage at Al Fieldhouse knows. So the, the good news is we're not pretending to be the experts in that space. And I'm confident we're going to have a really good, compelling, and frankly, better parking solution than we have today. That's what that's to me the litmus test of success is parking at the new stadium going to be better than it is today. And that may not be a high bar, so we better leap over that bar. But I think that's going to be important valuation from a tailgating perspective. We uh, literally, as we speak, and it, and it you know started with Missouri State. I think it took a step of Illinois. It'll continue as we look at a 2.30 kick against BYU. We're really now, I think, for the first time in a long time, evaluating the way our fans tailgate today. And then we're saying, hey, well, let's modernize it. How would you, if you had a clean slate, create formalized tailgating environments? How would you play off the neighborhood? How would you utilize other auxiliary space around the stadium, not just the obvious of big surface level parking lots or the hill? And we're taking a a step further, and we're going to look at, how do you better um, program the hill? So, for example, maybe you do some terracing on the hill. You make it where it's you know better accessibility. You've got locations of the hill that are flat. 
you can better utilize tents versus on a slope. You know, so there, there's all those things that are in play. And I, and I also, some juncture answered this question a little bit in this way, which is, I don't think we've been very good in tailgating or in parking. And yeah. I, I'm not talking about our fans. I'm, I'm talking about University of Kansas. I sure. don't think we've programmed tailgating very well. I don't think we've been very good in providing, you know, the right kind of parking solutions. And I really see this as the first time we've had a clean slate to address both of those really important issues. So, I'll, you know, we'll be held accountable. I know we better we better get it right, but I'm pretty confident we will. And so you talked about BYU there for a second. I'm curious, and you mentioned the importance of selling it out. At this point in time, what are the ticket sales looking like for for BYU, and do you expect that to be a sellout? Um, great question, Michael. I have not seen or asked for um, an update. I've anecdotally heard good things around where the trend line is. Um, and I'll just be honest with you. I completely fully expect it to be a sellout and I expect it to be a sellout sooner than rather than later. And I think any of us should, I think you guys should, I bet you guys do. And you should, because on, the honest part of this thing is we all need to set our sights higher. Like it, it shouldn't be about scratching and clawing to get to a sellout for BYU next week. It should be about matter of when and a matter of many days before the uh, kickoff is when that's achieved. So I'm hopeful that's what we'll be celebrating. We do know there'll be more visiting fans here um, than we would typically have, even, even with a, a, a bordering state big 12 opponent, BYU fans both travel. We also know there's a number of fans uh, in the Kansas city area. And so they've, they've been buying more than, uh, you would see in almost any other visiting situation and they're going to have a little presence. So we need to be sell out for all the right reasons, but we also need it to be as full of Jayhawk fans as possible because I think BYU fans will make their presence felt in there. And something you hit on earlier was the importance of showing support in selling out the stadium. Can you talk about the financial impact that has for you guys as an athletic department, a sellout versus under that versus way under that. Can you kind of yeah. explain the, the financial impact that would have on the athletic department? Yeah, I'll, gi I'll give you guys a, a real time kind of specific example. So um, 11 months ago. All right. I don't know what we were 11 months ago. Were we four and oh, maybe five and oh, ESPN game day with was either here or just been here or on the cusp of being here. But the vibes were good. We all remember um, a little bit further down the fall last year. Um, where we were at. Well, we also know that the, you know, the, the country was paying attention to Kansas. The country was paying attention to Lance Leipold. And there were some really interesting openings out there. And there was some real interest expressed by some of these really uh, uh, profound openings in college football. And I, I would just say um, I, we would have, we would have gotten it right period, but with the financial benefits of having three straight sellouts last fall and the trajectory and what we were seeing with where football revenues could be at Kansas, it gave us much greater confidence to put together a, a, a compensation package and salary package that we really feel like, you know, is, is more than significant and makes a real statement uh, both to Lance and the staff importantly, but really across the country that Kansas mm -hmm is going to, to both sustain this and invest in the right level. So I think, Michael, the short answer is it, it's given us a chance to reinvest back in the program, make sure we have continuity. It gives us a chance to do things like, you know, expedite the locker room and weight room projects. You know, that's a cash flow thing. If you either have the cash to do that or you don't, and we had the ability with some resources that were really generated through football to invest right back into the young men that are building this thing. And those are two tangible examples that if we didn't have the right attendance, if we didn't have trajectory around interest in the program, I hope we would have done it, but I'll be honest. I don't know how we would have done it. Hmm. When you, when you look at, uh, when you look at realignment, you know, another round just happened. The big 12 is heading into a new era, you know, so on and so forth. How do you feel that, that Kansas is equipped to compete there? And are you guys kind of hitting on the right notes at the right time a little bit, maybe 
to to where that there is that transition where you you know have a feeling like you can be one of the top athletic departments, if not the top athletic department, in sort of this new look Big Twelve. Yeah, no, I think we've we've talked about that, Kevin, and and <clears throat> I've, I think I've said that a little bit publicly, which is uh, whether whether be hey is you know is there going to be future uh, realignment? The, the assumption should be yes <laughs> sure. for everybody, right? Number one and number two, how do you feel about where KU resides in the Big Twelve? Um, and I think both answers are are, are really positive. I mean, the brand itself has long carried so much weight, the institutional strength being AAU, having, you know, potentially record-breaking enrollment, the research enterprise, the med school, the cancer cancer center, all those things really add so much value for KU um, in that discussion. But, you know, the, the liability for us has really long been the football situation, as you guys know. And so demonstrating over this past, you know, 13 months or so that football is not just on a great track, but has, you know, an almost un, you know, unprecedented ceiling, right? We don't even, we can't even see the ceiling on where we can go with this thing. I think it's a real positive, uh, but more than anything, it's, it's this recognition that we should be able to compete for championships in any sport at KU in the big 12. We should really have a chance to be, I'll say a or the leader in the league. And that's with, that's with humil- humility and that's with awareness that we've got a long way to go, but I fully expect us to be able to compete at that level in the big 12 year in and year out. And then the last part is I, I really truly couldn't feel better about the direction of the conference. I mean, I, you know, commissioner Yormark energy he's provided um, the, the, the four newest edition, you know, we got the four new, they're just, starting here this this fall and then we've got the four new new that come in next fall it's going to be a really really strong um stabilized 16 team conference and i think we've made that pretty clear that you know we're not going to take a back seat to anybody uh, across the country in in the highest level of college athletics travis i feel like the the world of college athletics has expedited since covid and I think probably the the world you started in, you know, m- many years ago is a lot different now. What's your assessment of just where college athletics seem to be going? I mean, you factor in NIL. Um, I know transfer portals more for individual sports, but just the overall direction. How do you assess where it's going? And, and just what are your thoughts on the way things are trending right now? Yeah, I, lo- I, I love that question too. And, and I really see myself as – being an optimist around the state of college athletics. I, you know, there's lots of things to maybe begrudge or, or, you know, talk about in a negative context, but the reality is I don't think it's ever been healthier. Now here's two, here's two ways to evaluate it. All right. Number one, how is the fan interest in college athletics? And I think it's, it's not just in a healthy state. I think it's growing and you could use women's basketball as an example, looking back to last March, you could use obviously college football, really any 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 week of the of the year as a great example. Expanded playoffs, another indicator of that. March Madness, on and on. So I think the fan support demonstrates that it's it's as healthy or healthier than it's ever been. And then the other one that doesn't get a ton of oxygen, I don't think, unfortunately, is I think the student athletes are having a better experience than they ever have. Because think about it, they're still getting education, right? It's not something that's talked about a lot. They're still getting, in, in many cases, the full scholarship kids, obviously, debt-free, free education at incredible institutions. Hard to, hard to put a value on that. Number two, they're getting all the physical and mental health resources any of us can, can throw at it. It's such an important aspect of what we do day in and day out. They're getting the best care, period. Um, three, they're getting great uh, you know, professional development and you know, life after sport support and assistance. And then now four, many of them are earning compensation, right? And, and that's a wonderful thing. And that's a really a great success story, quite honestly, with NIL. And we're seeing the value of it every day. We've got young people flying their families in who otherwise wouldn't be able to make it to games or meet them on the road who otherwise mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to meet them on the road. We've got success stories of guys and young women giving back to charities from the, the resources they've earned through NIL. And so – I think in those regards, the student athlete experience and the fan interest has never been better. And I think those are primary 
indicators that college athletics is healthy. Now there's, there's unknowns, you know, is it going to get to an employment model? Is it going to get to a revenue share model? Um, where do coaching salaries go? Is there any kind of ceiling on that? I, you know, I don't know the answer to it. Um, you know, the lawsuits that are out there and, and so on and so forth. But I, I have, I think our industry has long proven that it can, even if it doesn't do it proactively, it can adjust and evolve and continue to be one of the, one of the great aspects of American society. And I just think that's, that's the fixture that, that intercollegiate athletics is in our country. It's that, it's that important an aspect of society. We, uh, we talked a little bit about the football project, obviously, there's also the Allen Fieldhouse project coming up. I think you guys just finished a swim and dive locker room. Just sort of what what's what are the states of, of sort of different projects that, that you guys have going on outside of the Gateway project, including that Allen Fieldhouse project? Yeah, we, we actually went through a list with our executive staff the other day and probably half the items, many of the people in the room didn't even know we were doing. You know, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, res resurfacing projects. We're talking about, uh, pool liners in our in our current competitive pools to make sure those uh, have longevity, but also have a better experience for our swimmers. And then, of course, you know, in some ways, because of the Gateway Project, the Allen Fieldhouse Project hasn't gotten as much, you know, necessarily uh, uh, storyline around it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you guys, that thing is going to be unbelievable. We'll we'll see and taste aspects of it here uh, next month when people start rolling in, and we have kind of finished maybe what I'd consider the first 30% of that major, major renovation. But in a, about 13 months, people are going to see, I think, and, and experience more importantly, um, all the things they love and appreciate about Allenfield House, but with all the heightened benefits of, of fan experience, of beautiful first-class concourses, uh, restrooms, concessions, entry points, the premium experience on and on and on. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And then I think it's important to note that, you know, men's basketball and 16,000 benefit every game that we, we compete in there, but it's also, uh, it, it really sinks well with the build that's underway with women's basketball here at KU as well. Hmm. We got one more question for you. And Travis, I remember, 13 months, 14 months ago, we were staying in Dallas and we asked you about the IARP case for K basketball. And it, you had said at the time that hopefully the end is near and it seems like things have dragged on. I'll ask you a very similar question. It, is the end of this near? Do you expect this to, to linger for much longer? I know we're you know, a week maybe away from boot camp starting and the basketball season ramping up again. Uh, do you have an idea of when this would be wrapped up? I, I think it's in the, in the essence of being optimistic, Michael, it's, just, it's the answer I had back in Dallas 13, 14 months ago. I, I optimistically think that it is, um, it is sooner rather than later. Um, you know, one of the challenging parts of the, of the process is, and understandably so, is you don't, you go, you don't get a play-by-play -play and, and we don't expect a play-by-play -play and that's okay. Um, and so really, you know, all you've got at times is just your own assumptions and your own feel. Yeah. Um, but we know we're the last IARP case, right? There, there aren't any others in the cycle. We know that the IARP process will, will be no longer. And our, our instincts are that it, it won't be much longer. Um, and I know for everybody involved, it's going to be a, 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 in a lot of ways, a, a good moment, a good day or week or whatever it is to, to move forward and look out the, the big old windshield and not, not spend too much time, you know, staring in the rear view uh, uh, mirror, re lamenting the, the, the process. So mm. that's kind of the, the approach and the mentality and um, we'll be anxious at, at whatever juncture it does, does come before us. All right. I think that's what we've got for you, Travis. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I think we covered several different topics and hopefully fans got a little bit more of an insight into what's going on um, around the athletic department these days. Obviously football is picking up, but like you get on at the end, a lot of other projects going on too, that um, hopefully people get excited about in the long run. So thank you a bunch for, for coming on Travis. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for all the great work you do.